Okay, I hope I'm audible to everyone. Okay, good. So I'm audible and I think uh, we'll start. So, um, so basically, um, today's class is on placenta accrete syndromes or PAS. Now, what are placenta accrete syndromes? What, just one second. Yeah. Okay. So um, placenta accrete syndromes basically are a spectrum of disorders where the placenta fails to separate either partially or completely from the underlying uterine wall. Okay. So uh, normally you would have heard of placenta previa. Placenta previa is when the placenta is uh, basically on the implanted on the lower uterine segment. Now, whenever there's a uterine scar with placenta previa, it commonly, uh, it, 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 the, there's, a, there's a significant risk for placenta accrete syndrome. So remember a previous scar on the uterus with a low lying placenta and the most common scar on the uterus is obviously a cesarean section. So a previous cesarean section with a placenta previa is the most common and the most significant risk factor for developing placenta accrete syndromes. Now also remember that placenta accrete syndromes uh, which includes placenta accreta, placenta increta, and placenta percreta are is a very dangerous thing to have for the mother. It is has significant maternal morbidity and mortality because of the risk of postpartum hemorrhage or and during delivery when the placenta is when the, the placenta doesn't separate. So when an attempt is made to separate the placenta, that time the patient can bleed profusely. So it has a high maternal mortality and morbidity. Now, why does this happen? Okay, so very important. Why does this happen? So there's, there is a defect in the between the myometrium and the endometrium. So you see, this is the endometrium. This is this is the first block is a normal placenta. You see this thin yellowish line. This is the Netabuchs layer. So what is the Netabuchs layer? It is a fibrinoid layer which is normally present between the placenta and the underlying endometrium, the decidua basalis. So this Netabuchs layer is lost when we come to placenta accrete syndromes. So in placenta accreta, which is the first type, there is slight infiltration of the placenta into the myometrium. In increta, it is invading nicely into the myometrium and percreta it has perforated the uh, myometrium and it has gone inside the uterus. The, it has gone beyond the serosa and into the adjacent pelvic structures. So there is failure of normal decidualization in the corresponding uterine area, and this allows trophoblastic inf infiltration and villus tissue to develop deep within the myometrium and sometimes reach the surrounding pelvic organs. Most commonly, it, it can invade the bladder because the most significant risk factor is a previous cesarean section, which is anterior, and the structure anterior to the uterus is the bladder. So percreta commonly will involve the urinary bladder. So as I said, there are three subtypes, placenta accreta, also called as placenta creta, vera, or adherenta. So this is when it, the villi are attached to the surface of the myometrium without actually invading it. Then we have placenta increta, where the villi penetrate deeply into the myometrium up to the external layer and percreta, where it completely perforates through the uterine serosa and into the adjacent structures. So this is again just a picture showing a normal, this is actually not a normal placentation because this is a placenta previa. Normal placentation is always in the upper segment when we say normal placentation. So this is a placenta previa, but it is not adherent. This is a creta, this is in creta, and this is per creta. So you can remember a creta is adherent, in creta is infiltrative, I for infiltrative, P per creta, P for perforating. So that's a very easy way to remember. Now, as I said, there are many risk factors, but the most common risk factor is a previous surgical scar, and that is a previous cesarean delivery. Also, if she's had a previous MTP or a suction evacuation, DNC, a previous myometrium, especially when the endometrium has been breached, if she's had an endometrial resection, if she's had adhesiolysis for Asherman syndrome, all these can lead to a, a, an accreta in future pregnancies. Also, it has been found, although very rarely, non-surgical scars like an infection, an endometritis, or following chemotherapy, radi radiation, radiotherapy, or following things like an embryo transfer, where the endometrium is slightly just touched. 
uh, then an intrauterine device. So these also history of a manual removal of placenta, previous of a history of a previous accreta, all these can also lead to a uh, an accreta in future pregnancies. And it has been also found. So this is something new. Biconvert uterus, submucosal fibroids, adenomyosis, all these also can lead to abnormal trophoblastic infiltration and placenta accreta syndromes. But as I said, the most common risk factor, this is important because it can come in the exam, the most important and the most significant and the most common risk factor is a previous cesarean with a placenta previa. So if you get a patient with a previous cesarean with a placenta previa, this is the most common risk factor. So next, next question which can be asked is, how will you diagnose placenta um, uh, accreta syndromes? So the first step is we always, of course, advise an, a 2D or a conventional ultrasound for all our patients. Now see this picture here. Can you see this? Um, can you see this blackish, thin, hypoechoic area? So in ultrasound, we always call, call anything black as hypoechoic. Okay, like this is the bladder in front. How do I know it's the bladder? Because it's black and it's that means there is urine inside here. So anything fluid will be black on ultrasound, whether it's blood, water, amniotic fluid, urine, anything fluid which will appear black, anything which is dense white is bone. Anything in between is soft tissue. So this is the bladder anteriorly. This, this, this part is the uterine myometrium, this part. Okay, and this is the placenta. All this grayish area here you see is the placenta. So this is how a normal looking, this is a normal looking uh, ultrasound, a normal looking placenta on ultrasound. So you have the placenta, you have this hypoechoic or thin blackish area which is separating the placenta from the myometrium and then you have the bladder anteriorly. Okay, but look at this picture now. Okay, the same thing. Okay, the same view this is, this is the bladder. Okay, this is the placenta, but can you see the a separate myometrium like you can, you can see here? No, you can't see a separate myometrium or it's very thinned out. You can't see that thin hypoechoic line which should be somewhere here. That's also not seen. And you see these irregular blackish areas inside the placenta. These are called placental lacunae or placental lakes. So this is the placenta, this is the bladder, and this is actually a part of the fetus which you're seeing. So this is how a placenta accreta will look like on ultrasound. So what are the features? the features you'll see you'll see one second you'll see loss of the clear zone so this blackish area which i showed you was the clear zone the hypoechoic area behind the placenta separating it from the myometrium is called the clear zone so this is lost there are abnormal placental lacunae or venous lakes blood filled lakes inside the placenta there is bladder wall interruption especially if it is in creta or per creta there is myometrial thinning, okay? There is a placental bulge and a exophytic mass. This is seen again. There may be actually, the you may actually be seeing the placenta inside the uh, bladder. So that is in percreta. So you'll see a focal mass seen in the bladder. Now, just one second. Let me just clear all this. Okay. So, um, uh, but the best diagnosis, or if the question is asked, what is the diagnosis of choice? That is on doing a color Doppler. So ultrasound with color Doppler imaging is the investigation of choice. So this question has come in the past and it's very important to understand what exactly is the, uh, what exactly do we see when we do a color Doppler, Doppler imaging? So I'll just show you the picture here. So can you see this picture again here in front is the bladder, this is the placenta and all this blue red area here, this is vascularity. So in other words, there is hypervascularity. that means there are lots and lots and lots of vessels at this interface. What interface? The interface between the placenta and the uterine wall and the bladder. So that uterine wall placental bladder area is full of vessels. That is what is called as uterovesical hypervascularity. There is also subplacental hypervascularity. So, so behind the placenta, in between the uterus and the vessels and the bladder, bridging vessels are seen. And these lacunae which were there, they are also, they also show plenty of feeder vessels. And intra inside the placenta also, there is a lot of hypervascularity. So the key word here is hypervascularity. The placenta otherwise also is vascular, but it's not hypervascular. If you see something like this, it is definitely a creta. And this is the diagnosis, the investigation of choice is a color Doppler imaging.
Now, MRI is useful, but it is not the investigation of choice. This is where many people get confused. MRI is useful when the ultra ultrasound is inconclusive, that means we're not sure, and in placentas which are posteriorly placed. So, in an, an anterior placenta, you can clearly see it is easily visible, but anything which is posterior in the abdomen is difficult to visualize on ultrasound because the sound rays go in and then they're reflected back. So, anterior imaging is good. But something which is posterior in the body becomes difficult to see on an ultrasound. So if the placenta is posterior, it's difficult to see. And hence, an MRI is useful. Also, if you want to determine the exact depth of invasion in a percleta, how much is it going inside the bladder before surgery, we need to plan. Then also, MRI is useful. So you can see here, this is the fetus. And this here is the placenta, where the arrow is showing is actually the bulge inside the bladder. So this is how an MRI will look like of placenta accreta syndrome. Okay, now when a patient comes to us, uh, what are the risk factors we look for? One, I have listed all. So the most important I said is a previous cesarean section. And if our ultrasound shows a low-lying placenta, so previous cesarean with a low-lying low placenta is the most significant risk factor. That is the clinical risk factors. Also, this is a new thing now. Uh, have you heard of a cesarean scar pregnancy? Okay, this is a type of ectopic pregnancy. You must have heard of ovarian ectopic, abdominal ectopic. Uh, obviously, tubal ectopic is the most common. But there is something nowadays which is seen, which is called a cesarean scar pregnancy in the first trimester if it is diagnosed. So see this picture. This is a picture of a, this is a transvaginal scan. This is the uterus. This white line in the center is the endometrium. And this is the gestational sac. So normally, what you would find is the gestational sac would be somewhere here in a normal intrauterine pregnancy. But you can see this is anterior and this is posterior. This area is the lower part of the uterus, lower segment, and the sac has implanted, gone inside the myometrium and implanted in the previous cesarean section site. This is called a cesarean scar pregnancy. So these are becoming more and more common. When I was a postgraduate, uh, maybe around 13 years, 13, 14 years ago, we hardly, I think I saw two cesarean scar pregnancies in my entire three years. But the last two years, I've seen eight or nine cesarean scar pregnancies. So the, the incidence is increasing. Why is incidence increasing? Because of the increasing rate of cesarean section. So the more the cesarean sections, the obviously the more incidence of such abnormal things you will start seeing. All right, so this is, a cesarean scar pregnancy and if this goes undetected in the first trimester and the fetus continues to grow many times it will rupture it will it'll end up in, in an abortion or it will end up in a rupture either outside towards the serosal surface or inside and the patient may have hemoperitoneum pain all that some features of an ectopic pregnancy but suppose it continues to grow it is nicely in the myometrium this will eventually lead to placenta accreta syndrome. So cesarean scar pregnancy is a, now recognized as a risk factor for placenta accreta syndrome. This is also important to know. Okay, uh, one second. Yeah, then next is, uh, okay. So now uh, there is also a role of biochemical markers in detecting Placenta accreta syndromes. Can anyone tell me where else do we do beta HCG and PAPE? Where else do we do beta HCGs and PAPE in obstetrics to diagnose what other condition? Anomalies. Yes, anomalies. And anom more, more particular than anomalies, Pratmanjan, aneuploidies. Which aneuploidy are we specifically looking for when we do beta HCG and PAPE? And what is that test called as? Which aneuploidy? Down syndrome, yes. Down, Down syndrome. Down syndrome in, and this is called the double marker test. It is done between 11 to 14 weeks where we do a beta HCG and a PAP A. Okay. In Down syndrome, which is high, which is low? Or are both high or both low? Anyone can tell me? Actually, ma'am, beta HCG is high and PAP A is low. Very good. Very good. So how do you remember this? How I remember this is B se bada hua, hai na? B or B big. Me, so whenever me. you have a B, okay, that marker is increased in Down syndrome. So in double marker, beta HCG is increased, PAP is decreased. In quadruple marker, what are the markers? Anyone can tell me in quadruple marker? Uh, quadruple AFP, marker? estriol. 
beta yes, HCG estriol. and uh, uh, inhibin. Yes, yeah, so estriol, unconjugated estriol, inhibin A, beta HCG and PAP A. In me, a B kiss me aata hai. B is beta HCG and inhibin also has the letter B. Increase. So inhibin and beta HCG are raised in Down syndrome. PAP A and estriol are decreased. Decreased. That's it. That's it. That's it. Easy <coughs> to remember. B say bada hua, B say big. So beta HCG inhibin A are raised. The rest are decreased in Down syndrome. So that apart, very good. I'm glad you answered. Yes. So, uh, uh, so in uh, so the role of biochemical uh, chem markers, beta HCG and PAPE have also been found to be useful in screening for placenta acute syndromes. But I won't confuse you more ki ko, which is raised, which is decreased, because that is not important for you to know. Okay. So, uh, uh, if you want to know, you message me separately because I don't want to confuse everybody. It has been found to have a role. That is all you need to know. Okay. Now coming to management. So management, we have two main management. Um, uh, modalities one is surgical non conservative and one is surgical conservative. Now, can anyone tell me what do you mean by non conservative? Surgical non conservative mean, means what? What are we trying to not conserve, or what are we not conserving, or what are we trying to conserve? Okay, someone's answered. The uterus, very good, Prithmesh. So the uterus, so basically when we have placenta accreta syndrome, please remember that the main, main, the main worry is, or the main, uh, more, main worry is, hem, is hemorrhage, right? So the main modality of treatment till today still remains, do a cesarean, take the baby out and then do a hysterectomy. There is very little role for conservative management because of the in very, very high risk of hemorrhage. All right. So, so by when I say surgical non-conservative, it means hysterectomy kar do, iska cesarean karo and then do a cesarean hysterectomy. When I say surgical conservative, it means I am conserving the uterus. I am not going to do a hysterectomy. Okay, so this is a picture. Uh, my friend sent me this picture. She was doing, she opened up a patient for a cesarean and this is what she saw. This is the uterus. Okay, and these are big, big vessels on the lower uterine segment. Okay, so this is norm. Is this what, what is normally seen when we, when we do a cesarean section? Most, uh, those of you who have assisted a cesarean section would have seen the uterus, how it looks like. This is not how it looks like, okay? So this is, yeah, it looks pink and it doesn't, ha it has some vascularity, but see the vessels here, see how tortuous they are. Imagine giving an incision right here, okay, to take the baby out. Imagine how much it would bleed. So this is how dangerous placenta accreta can be. So let's go to the first management that is surgical non-conservative, as I said, Surgical non-conservative means we are not conserving the uterus. We are removing the uterus. So we are doing a cesarean hysterectomy. And this still today remains the treatment of choice in placenta accreta syndromes because of the increased risk of hemorrhage. And it is still what 70 to 80% of obstetricians will resort to eventually. Okay. So it is. it remains a definitive surgical treatment for past disorders, especially for its invasive form. That means in creta and per creta, cesarean hysterectomy is the norm. It is the definitive surgical treatment. So what is done? A primary elective cesarean hysterectomy is the safest and the most practical option. So this is a picture of a uterus, which a hysterectomy, which has been done. So what has been done? This is, see the lower part? This is all the placenta. You can see how it's gone inside the myometrium. You can see the upper segment. This is the myometrium. See how it's all invaded and the baby was taken out from the upper segment. So this is a specimen of a placenta accreta syndrome. Okay. Now, so what do we do? How do we do this? So we always plan placenta accreta delivery a cesarean between 34 to 37 weeks. Why 34 weeks and why 37 weeks? Because 34 weeks is when fetal lung maturity is attained and we don't want to wait too long. Okay. Beyond 37 weeks, she can go into labor any day and she will come in the, as an emergency. She will come in the night and then uh, you won't have enough manpower to manage her. So every as her gestational age keeps increasing, the risk of her bleeding increases. The risk of her going into labor increases. So well, this is the guidelines say always operate placenta accreta electively, preferably between 34 to 37 weeks. Okay, so obviously because we know she's going to bleed, we have to build up her hemoglobin. And very, very important points. The uterine incision 
has to be a classical uterus uterine incision okay why so this is the uterus okay this is normally how we give our incision this is a curves incision or a lower uterine segment incision but in a creta what happens the the placenta is all lying here in the lower uterine segment most of the time especially if it's after a, if it's with following a previous cesarean so if we give the incision here we're just ending up going to cause more of a mess so we give the incision here this is a classical cesarean so remember placenta accreta syndrome is an indication for a classical cesarean section can anyone tell me the other indications for classical cesarean section it is very rarely done classical where else will you do a classical cesarean section anyone no one okay we have a question on this in the end in mcq we will attempt this question there okay so what are the other steps the other steps are we give, give a classical cesarean take the baby out leave the placenta behind do not touch the placenta and after taking the baby out directly proceed for a hysterectomy there's an increased risk of illogical injuries and of course blood loss so take measures to prevent blood loss so this is the two things you should remember are do a classical cesarean and leave the placenta behind and then do a hysterectomy that is what you need to remember for a non conservative surgical approach <clears throat> the next is conservative so suppose the patient has placenta accreta especially a focal accreta the whole placenta is not adherent you feel only a part of the placenta is adherent on your doppler you see only some area is adherent and the patient is very keen on conserving her uterus she is keen on having more babies so in such a circumstance you can consider conservative management so basically it, it is it defines all procedures that aim to avoid a hysterectomy and its related morbidity and consequences so there are two ways to do this one is do a classical cesarean as i said do a cesarean do a put a classical incision remove the baby then what do you do you leave the you suture the incision and you leave the placenta in situ and you come out so leaving the placenta in situ is called the expectant approach and then what do you do what do you do you monitor every week with ultrasounds or mri and beta hcg values and the placenta will gradually get resorbed by itself and this happens over a period of 2 to 3 months in that period you have to be very careful that the patient doesn't develop an infection or again hemorrhage many patients will still require a hysterectomy because of these two complications which may happen later on so this is one thing which has been tried and it has around a 60% success rate that means we are able to conserve the uterus in 60% of patients who undergo this method of conservative management so again what did i well, i'll repeat we give a cesarean we do a cesarean by a classical incision take the baby out suture the incision and that's that's our cesarean that's our cesarean done we don't attempt to touch the placenta at all leave it there let it get resorbed by itself of course the risk factors have to be explained bleeding and infection and she because of these two she may require a hysterectomy at a later date the other option is do a uh, don't read all this this is a little confusing so what you do is you do it's a basically a one step surgery you do a cesarean again a classical cesarean take the baby out and then gradually you saw all those big vessels start devascularizing those vessels you may even have to do a uterine artery ligation and internal iliac artery ligation but gradually after devascularization resect the area of placenta and wherever the uterus is invaded in, resect that area and then reconstruct the uterus so it's a very time consuming procedure it requires vascular surgeons urologists the gynecologist of course it's a multidisciplinary approach but this has been tried with varied success rates okay so we can either leave the placenta behind or we can resect the placenta with the affected uterus uterine part the myometrium which is affected and then reconstruct the uterus okay of course uh, uh, interventional radiological procedures like uterine artery embolization or placement of balloon catheters has also been also needs to be done during such procedures because of the risk of bleeding can anyone tell me where else do we do uterine artery embolization tell me two other indications of uterine artery embolization 
PPH good, so it is used for postpartum hemorrhage. Very good. And one more. Where else do we do uterine artery embolization? Gynecologically. Anyone else wants to answer? Where else do we do uterine artery embolization? No one? Okay, so we do it in fibroids. So in uterine fibroids, also we can do uterine em artery embolization, especially in those women who do not want to conserve the yeah fibroid punctage. Very good. Okay, so not GTN, Pratmesh, but fibroids and PPH is where we do uterine artery embolization. A third use of uterine artery embolization in obstetrics is in placenta accreta syndromes prior to surgery or during surgery, this can be done. Okay, so this is basically the uh, main gist of what I wanted to tell, what you need to know for your exams. Okay, so let's quickly do some MCQs. Risk, this is a previous year question. Risk factors for placenta accreta include all of the following except. Quickly, quickly, unmute or write in the chat box. Which is not a risk factor for placenta accreta? Yes, Pratmesh is right. Anyone else wants to answer? Bobby is right. Good. So the answer is D. That means previous LSCS scar, yes, it is a risk factor. Previous curatage, yes. Previous myomectomy, yes. So these are all scars on the uterus. But previous placenta, only a previous placenta previa in the past pregnancy, if she had, that is not a risk factor. A placenta previa in the present pregnancy with the previous scar is definitely a risk factor. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So next question. Okay, all our features of placenta accreta on ultrasound and Doppler except. Anyone wants to attempt this? So which is not a feature of placenta accreta on ultrasound and Doppler. So I'm getting some answers. Yeah, M is right and Pratmesh is right. Bobby is also right. So the so hypervascularity is seen, okay, vascular lacunae are seen in the placenta and placenta bulging into the posterior bladder wall is seen. What is, so what is not seen is we basically, the absence of the retroplacental zone or the clear zone is absent, not present in accreta. In a normal, this is a no, finding of a normal placenta. All right, the presence of this hypoechoic area is normal. Absence of this area is a feature of placenta accreta. Okay, next question. Okay, so in which of the following conditions will the below incision not be given during cesarean section? So this is a classical cesarean. Where in which condition will we not? This puncture is also right. Okay, this question now. Well, where will we not give this incision? Uh, Prathmesh is right. A, Bobby, no. So basically, let me explain to you now this question. Okay, so the correct answer is abruption. Okay, we will, in abruption, we will resort to a normal lower segment uterine incision. So this is the uterus. Okay, this is our normal lower segment uterine incision. And this is our upper segment or classical. This is very rare. We, we don't do this now, but we do it only for very few indications. Okay, so when do you think we will have to do this? Think logically. One is I've already told you, placenta agrita syndromes. Okay, this one you've all understood. P.S. We will do this. Suppose there's a large fibroid sitting here. Okay. The third option, a large low-lying leomyoma. Where will I give my incision? I can't give my incision anywhere here. So I will have to resort to giving an upper segment incision. Now, suppose these previous three, previous four cesarean sections. What happens? Every time we dissect the bladder away from, the, to approach the lower segment, you have to dissect the bladder away from the lower segment so that we are able to approach it. A patient who has had previous multiple surgeries, sometimes there are dense adhesions present here and you can't separate the bladder. So if you end up giving your incision, you may end up injuring the bladder. So if there are lots of adhesions or a densely adherent bladder, we sometimes prefer to give the incision here. That's another indication for a punctus right A. So that's another indication for doing a classical cesarean. Abruption, placenta previa, all these we can easily tackle with a lower segment incision. Any other indication you can think of where we'll do a classical cesarean, which is not mentioned here? Very, very rare. Your books, all your books give this. So if there is carcinoma of the cervix, okay, CA cervix with pregnancy, which is again very, very rare, 
then you will again resort to doing it. VVF, previous VVF, okay, vasicovaginal fistula repair. Um, not really, unless, um, because that's a vasicovaginal fistula. We're talking about the low, lower uterine segment. If the lower, if it was a uterovesical fistula with the fistula being in the lower uterine segment, then maybe yes. Okay, but uh, uh, another indication is if there's carcinoma of the cervix, we don't touch the lower segment. We deliver the baby by an upper segment cesarean section. So these are a few indications which you should know for giving for doing a classical cesarean section. Okay, next, um, uh, one second. Okay, next question. A 24-year-old G2 with a previous cesarean presents at 30 weeks with complaints of painless vaginal bleeding. The ultrasound shows a low-lying placenta. The resident thinks it could be a creta and orders which investigation? Easy question. So basically the investigation of choice. Yes, that is a, a color Doppler, not MRI. Why M? Why are you saying MRI? I just explained MRI, the investigation of choice in a placenta accreta is a color Doppler. Okay, see the question says ultrasound was done. What will you order next? The next thing you will order is a color Doppler, which is done with the ultrasound. Okay, but when it, this, this, when the when he says ultrasound, ultrasound clearly means a conventional 2D ultrasound. Nothing else is mentioned. So the investigation of choice is you will send her back and ask for a color Doppler because that is the investigation of choice and MRI is ordered only if you're not sure about the ultrasound or if the placenta is posterior and not really visible on ultrasound. Okay, because they're going for another investigation but Doppler has not been done, only ultrasound has been done. M. <clears throat> Have you understood my point? Only ultrasound has been do done Doppler has not been done. Okay, so ultrasound is different from a color Doppler. Yes, the machine news is the same, but the investigations are different. Ultrasound is different. Color Doppler is different. Uh, color Doppler is an additional investigation which can be done during the ultrasound. Okay, I hope that makes it clearer. Okay. Okay, next uh, question. A 30-year-old with previous two LSCS presents at 26 weeks. On her routine scan, she has been diagnosed with placenta previa. She is worried about the risk of her having an adherent placenta. You explain to her what? What is her risk? I've not discussed this. Anyone knows can answer. The, what is the risk of previous two cesarean with placenta previa? What is her risk of having adherent placenta? Anyone? No risk. Why no risk? She's pre I just said the most common risk factor um, in for placenta akita syndrome is a previous cesarean with a, okay, no, okay, that's a mistake. So is, is a pre previous cesarean with a placenta previa. So anyone who's had a previous cesarean with a placenta previa now is at additional risk of placenta akita. But how much is that risk? Okay, so let's try to understand that. So if she's had one cesarean, the risk is 3%. Okay, so one previous LSCS with placenta accreta risk is 3%. Two previous LSCS with placenta accreta, the risk is around 11 to 12%. Okay, three previous sections with pre uh, uh, placenta uh, previa, the risk is around 35 to 40%. Okay, and four previous cesareans with placenta previa, the risk is 60%. Okay, so this is how it increases. So the number of cesareans does matter. One cesarean risk of a keta is 3%, two cesareans risk of a keta is around 11 to 12%, three it is around 40%, four it is around 60%. So the answer is 12%, yes. This is the correct answer. Okay, so, so it does matter. The number of cesareans definitely does matter when you're explaining to the risk to the woman. I think the last question, 24-year-old with previous LSCS is diagnosed to have placenta accreta. She's planned for delivery by cesarean at 36 weeks. All are true regarding morbidly adherent placenta except. So morbidly adherent is also PS, placenta accreta syndrome. What is not right amongst the choices, which is the wrong statement? Yes, Prathmesh, Bobby, right. The correct answer is, and someone else's answer, Pankaj is also right, C. So there is an increased risk of maternal mortality, is right. MRI is useful in diagnosing a preterm and posterior placentas, is right. During cesarean, 
a gentle attempt is made at delivering is wrong no attempt is made during cesarean at uh, cesarean section uh, sorry uh, during cesarean we are supposed to leave the placenta alone you're not supposed to handle the placenta no attempt should be made at delivering a suspected accreta placenta okay and yes upper segment cesarean is usually performed to deliver the baby so this was the lecture on placenta accreta i think it was useful i hope it was useful for you all and it's something which is uh, very um, um, uh, com more common these days. Same as cesarean scar pregnancy, placenta accreta is in our PG days, we hardly saw one in a year. Now we see one every two to three months. So the frequency is increasing. And if the frequency of something increases, it is definitely a chance that you will get this in your exam. Okay, so while I was preparing this PPT, I found something very interesting. So Raisa Nitabuk is a pathologist of the, in the 19th century. She was born and she's the one who described the Nitabuk's lair. But what was actually very interesting is that she's the only woman whose name is affiliated with a macroscopic anatomical structure, which I was very surprised to see that she's the only woman. All other anatomical structures have been named after men. And she's the only woman who has an anatomical structure named after her, which I found very Interesting trivia. Uh, okay, so Prathmesh is asking, good question. Methotrexate has a role in morbidity at the placenta? So no, many people do give methotrexate. Uh, for, so we leave the placenta behind in conservative approach. And then I said we monitor every week. So some people have, so have um, found that have been giving methotrexate to help in faster resorption of the placenta. But recent guidelines, the FIGO guidelines now say there is no role for methotrexate. It has not been found to be helpful. That's why I didn't mention it. It is no longer found to be helpful. These are recent guidelines which have come out two years ago. Okay, they are, it is no longer found to be useful. So it is no longer required to be given. But yes, I know many places people still give if you follow the good guidelines and the book, it is not supposed to be given. Okay, so this is about... Oh, yeah, so yeah, you all know it's a lot of updates. So this is recent guidelines, not required methotrexate, no longer recommended. And um, uh, this will end my lecture, I think. Okay, so yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Any more questions? Okay, Bobby says, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I will put this up on YouTube for future reference. Thank you, M. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me now or later ask me in the group. Okay, so yeah, Pratmesh, I know I love OBG because uh, this is the exact reason I love OBG because it has it has a mixture of everything. It has a mixture of radiology, it has a mixture of medicine, there's surgery, there is neonatology, there is everything inside this. So it's a very exciting subject and it's it, it brings joy to um, a lot of people, especially the obstetrics part. So thank you everyone. And we will put this up on YouTube so you can check this out later. Please send the link to your friends. I will put this up in the group also. Thank you.